Perfect. So good morning, everyone. I'm Yun Chong. I also go by Richie. I'm a grad student at Stanford, mainly working with Risa, and I also work with Peter, amazing collaborators here. So today I'm going to talk about modeling dwarf galaxy star formation with Universe Machine. So, I mean, I don't need to convince you that dwarf galaxies is an exciting field and it's a frontier to discover many new physics. But, you know, there are just loads of dwarf galaxies we're starting to detect, as Risa just mentioned. Uh, in very low masses, they spend like seven orders of magnitude and stellar mass. Uh, some are very local in the local group. Um, when we go out to the local volume, we detect more of them in more host environments. And then there will be so much more that comes up with JWST and also Rubin. So we really want a framework that goes beyond just simple abundance matching at a, a single redshift and really encode their formation histories, their star formation histories, that go back all the way to, say, redshift six or seven, probed by the local group dwarfs, and connect them with, like, these large samples of dwarf galaxies in the local volume and potentially JWST dwarfs at higher redshifts. So we want this framework, and Universe Machine was originally designed to do galaxy halo connection in this evolutionary way, and it's very simple, or it's very straightforward to think that we can extend this framework to lower masses, it's not the case, as I will show you. And we're actually learning something about dwarf galaxy, how they connect to their halos uh, on these scales. So um, I will first tell you about an overview of the modeling and what, the, uh, what assumptions goes into that, um, and what we found by directly applying this model to a set of zoom-in simulations um, that actually resolved dwarf subhalos. And of course, there were a lot of parts that didn't fit together, that didn't work because it was, it was unconstrained. And then what new models we're testing out uh, in this dwarf galaxy mass regime and applying new constraints, how well we're doing right now. And there are still a lot of improvements uh, to be done and there's a lot of ongoing and future directions. Um, so starting with an overview, um, this universe machine modeling approach really sits sort of within uh, the midpoint of these more physical driven models like hydrosims and SAMs and more empirical driven models like abundance matching uh, that Risa just talked about on Ethan's work. So you could think of it as sort of a tunable SAM that's really simplistic, it shortcuts all the gastrophysics, but then you can run parameter exploration such that you find an optimal uh, parameter combination of the SAM that can match observations over a wide range of masses and redshift skills. So it starts by assuming uh, sort of a population statistics and average uh, star formation rate as a function of halo uh, mass that's probed by Vmax, and also a fraction of quenched objects as a function of halo mass. So with these two, at every uh, halo mass and redshift scale, you can come up with a PDF, a distribution of how star formation rates are distributed uh, at this uh, mass scale. Uh, but then, you know, this quench fraction, it sort of uh, characterizes how the quench population, which is this left peak, uh, what's the normalization compared to the star forming fraction? And then the SFR versus Vmax scaling determines for the star forming population where the median is. And so the next step is once you have a PDF at every redshift and halo mass scale, you need to map them onto individual halos. And here's uh, what Peter, uh, after many explorations, found this was a very good and flexible uh, scaling that measures like the recent uh, halo accretion status or halo formation history over some uh, either dynamical time scale or the time since your peak halo mass. So you could think of these two different scenarios where if there is a very weak correlation between individual halos star formation rate and their recent uh, accretion history, um, the probability of being quenched or star forming is almost independent of being in a low accretion or high accretion rate halo. So in this case, things that are within larger clusters having low accretion rate have the same probability as they would quench uh, in the field. But then if you have the same overall quench fraction, I'm depicting 50% of overall quench fraction. Uh, but if your star formation rate correlates perfectly with your halo accretion rate, then you only quench the low accretion stuff in halos and you keep all the field uh, galaxies uh, forming, star forming. So this is actually one important part of the uh, model that's actually constrained by data, so it's a free parameter. And so essentially with this sort of very simplistic SAM, you go from these halo mass and halo uh, accretion rate status as a function of redshift, you create a mapping between these halo parameters and the SFR, and you're able to map SFR onto halos. So once you start painting them onto the merger trees, you can then integrate over a dark matter only simulation, and you can make predictions on cell mass functions, quench fractions, and clustering as a function of redshift. You also apply relevant uh, observational systematics, and then you can calculate the likelihood. 
you do this a million times in parameter space, you map out the posterior and you come up with a best fit model that can simultaneously match the constraints here. So this is the abundance matching part. The previous one was the sand part. You do this uh, flexibly. So it's a self-consistent flexible model that matches a wide range of uh, mass and redshifts. But then, you know, thinking about the observations that put into the original universe machine VR1 model, I'll refer to it as VR1 from now, um, there were only some constraints on dwarf galaxies down to 10 to the 7 from the stellar mass function and everything else about their like specific star formation rate quench fractions and clustering, they all go above 10 to the 9. So it's really constrained down to the uh, LMC regime and we just wanted to see if we apply this model directly to high resolution zoom in simulations, what would happen? So this is the first part of my work as a PhD, so combining UM universe machine with multi-resolution cosmological simulations. And, you know, this was one of the first uh, conversations I had with Risa when I started grad school. Let's just apply this to the universe machine and see what happens, right? We have this uh, amazing 45, like, Milky Way zoom-ins run at dark matter resolution of 10 to the 5. These are all dark matter only. And this was run by Yao, uh, Mao Yao Yuan, uh, former student uh, with Risa now at Utah. And we are sort of expecting to find inconsistencies of the model performing at these dwarf galaxy scales. But then this exercise is very important to identify model limitations and guide us where we need to improve in the future. And by developing this method, we really realized that we have to join together a statistical sample of these zoom-ins together. Otherwise, especially at the high mass end, when you have only one Milky Way and one LMC at those scales, and it couldn't really do that SFR mapping onto uh, different halos when you need to rank their accretion rates. So we joined them together, and that's from like these 125 megaparsec parent boxes you see here. And definitely this zoom in is required to resolve all these very detailed substructures in the Milky Way. So as a result, it enabled us to come up with this empirical galaxy halo connection framework that extends universe machine, but then it helps us place dwarfs together with their hosts, their more massive counterparts, but also different cosmological contexts sampling a wide range of their host accretion histories and environments. So uh, what did we find? First, this is the halo mass function. That's the summary of the simulations we were using. And this is the stellar mass halo mass relation with universe machine PR1 uh, applied to it. So, you know, I think what I want to highlight here is that we really need zoom in simulations if we want to model all, all observable dwarfs in one go. So, especially for the ultra faint dwarfs that are here that goes down to like 100 solar masses relates to the question what we call it. But, you know, um, sorry, the, the observable dwarfs really go down really low. And here, you know, all the cosmological sims reach their resolution limit if you want to probe this regime. So you need this multi-resolution framework. And now we have it here. So how believable is this stellar mass scale mass relation and how does the model really perform in this mass range below stellar mass of 10 to the 9 where it's unconstrained? So if we really compare it to this um, Ethan Nadler's work that Risa just mentioned from DES and PanStars, that's sort of state-of-the-art uh, observational constraint based on Milky Way satellites, it gives uh, the blue band that's universe machine DR1, it's a pretty good match with the latest observational constraints. But we want to ask like, okay, it's sort of an extension of just this power law we highlight here, Peruzzi 2019, this dotted curve, it goes down, you know, it's a single power law. Did things get here in the right way? And it turns out that they didn't. So on the right, what I'm showing is that if I take the universe machine and zoom in galaxies, from 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6, so in this region, and then plot their normalized star formation history as a function of time, they form a crazy amount of 0.7. And at first we thought there was something wrong with our dark matter simulation. Peter looked at this and said, oh, they're just crazily accreting dark matter at late times, and that's obviously not the case. Like we checked their Vmax uh, evolution as a function of time. The field ones are flat and the satellites are losing mass. That should be the case. So it's really the wrong set of parameters that's now extrapolated to this mass range that stopped working. But then like, do we have hints on how to improve this? Well, yes, we do. So if we look at the quench fractions at redshift zero, why, why is, okay, now it's flipping. So if we look at the quench fractions at redshift zero, it really is this functional form of an error function that was parameterized for the high mass constraints originally that went into the universe machine, now extended down to dwarf galaxies, forces both field and satellites to have a zero quench fraction towards redshift zero. And then if you use a combination of the SFR versus halo mass scaling that's also extended down 
it just gives you this very weird late time star formation that makes them end up where they should be on the stellar mass function because there were constraints at 10 to the 7, but now, like, this is what's happening. So, you know, reflecting on um, this uh, original model, they, Peter and Risa and all, uh, Andrew and Charlie didn't really have the uh, need to parameterize things down here, but we know if we look at the newest observation data from Ida Saga, a Milky Way, there might be some um, things we need to understand better here, but it shouldn't be zero, right? There should be a probability of non-zero quench fraction that's allowed by this. So that goes on to my ongoing work and, you know, just adding salt, adding new model, new quenching to universe machine out of these mass scales, and then we want to essentially reconstrain the model with these constraints that now, now are in this, uh, inconsistent with the current model. So I started playing around with, you know, adding just basically another set of error functions at lower masses. You know, it just go, goes to one, and then there is some fiducial redshift evolution of it. You can see that these dotted lines here, they're very uh, light. That's the original universe machine model. I'm adding this to it. And then with a hand-picked set of parameters, this is applied to one zoom in halo. Already you can see that, you know, it quenches the dwarfs. It produces a much higher uh, quench fraction. And if you look at the normalized star formation history, it's very close to already in this mass spin of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 that compared to local group dwarfs. But then, you know, this is not the end of the day, and it's not like, say, okay, we're done, because immediately what happens if you adopt a model that only changes the quenching, you quench their late time star formation, these dwarfs, they lose half of their redshift zero stellar mass. So you lose your match to your original star uh, stellar mass functions and your stellar mass hill mass relation. So obviously we also need to free up the original low mass end of the st uh, star formation rate versus halo mass scaling in universe machine. And then I stuck with this over like eight months trying to reconstrain the model with these two, um, two assumptions, basically more quenching in dwarfs and then this SFRV max scaling turns out to be not the case because I was only using constraints from the Saga data, which is basically in Milky Way like halos, you know the quench fraction of satellites, but then there is this degeneracy of mapping how you map SFR onto these halos in the model framework, right? So these two degenerate cases are exactly what I uh, introduced in the beginning. You could have a high overall quench fraction, that's the white curve for all dwarfs, and then basically no correlation with halo accretion history, and you could match the Saga quench fractions in this way, and the field quench fractions will also look exactly the same, which is this no correlation case between halo formation history and SFR, or you can have a much lower overall quench fraction, and then a very strong correlation between SFR and halo uh, accretion status, and the field would all be like uh, star forming and only quench the uh, satellites around Milky Way halos, as in this case. So what we really need to do is also free up how SFR is correlated with halo formation uh, history, and this needs to be jointly constrained by data from something like Saga and also field dwarfs in SDSS. So everything on the next slide is very tentative. This is unpublished data. We're showing a very prototype model. So if we do that, and I've run like a 200,000 step MCMC using the green data points from Saga here, this is the completeness corrected quench fractions, and then this is for the field halos from uh, Marlaki had 12, we will end up something that looks like this. So the high mass part, we're freezing it out. That's just the universe machine DR1, but this part is sort of what it does. So the overall idea here, this is not perfect, but then, you know, this is very close to what we have in our bag. Um, it does a reasonable job at mass scales where we have constraints, but then if we extrapolate this model down further below 10 to the 7 where there aren't constraints, say, in the field, uh, because of this error function uh, quench fraction parameterization we're assuming, it, again, you know, enforces a non-zero quench fraction, and we are sort of actively exploring different models and broader assumptions uh, and see can we, you know, actually allow the model to have a zero quench fraction for, uh, say, the field dwarfs all the way down to 10 to the 5 and allow the quenching for Milky Way satellites up here. So this is something ongoing. And as the last part, I will just um, briefly highlight some other directions we're thinking about and um, what improvements that we could be making to 
this framework that's already sort of half working and we're still sorting out the details. So these three future directions I would highlight, obviously after implementing Saga and also SDSS field dwarfs, uh, this kind of classical dwarf regime down to 10 to the seven constraints into our model, we want to go further down to like 10 to the four, 10 to the five and actually add the local group constraint. So that only not, that not only probes like lower masses, but also it goes to higher redshift. Um, and once we get there, we actually will hit uh, the regime where reionization quenching should be important. And obviously reionization is very different from environmental quenching and we need different parameterizations for that. So we need an effective model that takes care of reionization quenching. Um, and also, you know, as Risa mentioned, there are a lot of things that mimics, uh, you know, dark matter, uh, different uh, dark matter models. But then one thing that we don't have in our dark matter only simulations is the baryonic effect of an embedded disk that actually modulates the subhalo population and disrupts a lot of these things that pass through the center. So I'm leading this effort to rerun our 45 Milky Way zoom-in simulations with embedded disk potentials like fat Elvis plus plus, but then it's really different from that. Uh, I'll get to it. And then we are I will also advertise this other halo mass scales we have now, zoom ins all the way from LMC host masses all the way to galaxy clusters uh, spanning five orders of magnitude in host mass so we can really generate or generalize this uh, modeling framework to all observable galaxies around different host mass scales. So, you know, um, just to re-emphasize the model constraints we have now put into the new universe machine model are just redshift zero classical dwarfs from the local volume. Right. Um, this doesn't mean that it has constrained star formation histories when we go to higher redshift. And we really need the local group doors that actually do have color magnitude diagram star formation histories from HST to do it. Um, but, you know, just thinking of it, uh, this is work by Rodriguez Wimberley in 2019. Um, the way this was characterized were like a few attempts to match like local group doors uh, across the different uh, quenching time scales. And there is still a lot to learn about how this picture varies with different halo accretion histories and halo environment. And we might be able to better constrain this transition uh, era between reionization quenching and uh, environmental quenching at higher masses with local group doors under our framework. So this is ongoing work. And uh, just to emphasize these uh, disk re-simulations I'm leading on. So, you know, this is obviously a Milky Way halo, but you can imagine if you put in an analytic disk potential here, it's gonna actually disrupt a lot of uh, subhalos and mimic the baryonic disk with a very little increment on the computational demand. And um, this will actually result in a more realistic subhalo population. And this is actually the set of simulations that we want to use for applying the local group doors onto because this is more realistic. And then most importantly, you know, differences with something like Fat Elvis is we allow our disks to actually grow according to their universe machine predicted uh, star formation histories, which is actually more self-consistent. So the last part, you know, just a uh, big shout out to Ethan. Let me play this movie uh, and a lot of uh, other amazing team members in our group and our collaborators. This is a really huge undertake to expand the suite of 45 Milky Way uh, simulations I've mentioned here at host mass scale of 10 to the 12, now down to LMC at around 10 to the 11, and also other mass scales that go up to clusters. So we have like 262 of them. This is called Symphony, and they're run at various uh, mass resolutions. All the Rockstar halos and consistent trees are publicly available at this site, so please contact us and feel free to download and explore them. I did the universe machine part on all of these 262 halos, and this is the stellar mass hill mass relation of it. So we're really covering like 11 orders of magnitude in stellar mass and eight orders of magnitude in uh, halo mass. And this is what we brand as, you know, a consistent uh, galaxy halo connection framework that can model all observable dwarfs. But then we didn't make this public yet because we want to update the uh, dwarf galaxy um, population first and you know, better understand the physics down here. And once we have the new universe machine model applied to it, we will release it together with the Symphony collaboration. So I will leave my uh, summary slide here and uh, thanks for your attention. All right, so uh, before asking questions, uh, please, say, uh, please say your full name. Yeah.
thanks for this great talk. Uh, when you started showing uh, your zooming simulations, you showed the halo mass function with a bump in 10 to 12. Do you have an explanation for that bump? Oh, uh, great question. It is just a selection effect for oh. our uh, zoom in regions because what I'm uh, showing in this plot is really a sort of um, the number density of Milky Way mass objects in the zoom in region, right? In the zoom in region. So it's like a 10 year, 10 RV year thing around the Milky Way that we're actually implementing the high resolution uh, mass resolution here. And if you calculate the densities, it's just going to be slightly higher. Yeah, that's just a selection of that. Hey, hey, Richie, it's Martin Wright. Um, I have a, I don't know if it's controversial or not question. Um, do we actually need to do Zoom? So don't get me wrong, I love Zooms. This is all of what I do. But given the, <laughs> given the scale that, and the particle masses that we're talking about here, what actually is preventing us from running something like TNG 100, but when one more click in the dark matter particle mass so that we reach the kind of levels that we're talking about here? Given, given the scale of the dark matter only really large boxes that people run for cosmology, for example, what is preventing us from doing that? So I actually swept something under the rug. The classical dwarf or, you know, the, the local volume constraints I put in was actually run with the C25, uh, 2048 box. So I'm actually using this cosmological sample to sample more like Milky Way mass environments. Um, if we are only thinking about classical dwarf in this regime, but we really need that for the ultra faints. You know, if you go down to halo masses of 10 to the 8, I don't think we're there yet with, you know, cosmological volumes of uh, resolution at this level. Yeah. Any questions? Um, so I have a question. Yeah. So this is Hao Wenjiang speaking. Um, so my question is, um, you are using the zoom-in simulation to basically get a constraint at the low mass end. So at the same time, are you also using the existing dark matter halos from, say, Bolshoi Planck box to make sure that you still reproduce the galaxy properties at more mass event, or you're only using the zoom-in halos? So the answer is that neither. We are using this box. <laughs> sort of to connect those two things like at the very high mass end because you know um, this box goes up to like 10 to the 14 it has a couple of halos at this mass scale but then you know if we look at the correlation functions it's really a very small patch of the universe it doesn't match very well with bullshit plan that's a good point but then it has reasonable resolution to resolve the classical dwarfs so we're running our constraints here and eventually once we pin down how the model should behave down to this sort of 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 halo mass scale, we will then go to the zoom ins for only the local group dwarfs. So it is sort of, you know, with this multi-resolution framework, we pin down one mass scale at a time, and then we stitch them together. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Any questions? Hi, Richie. I'm Christian Jesperson here. So we saw in, in Risa's talk earlier that there is a lot of, you know, of these, you know, um, you know, large scale, uh, large power scale mo um, new dark matter models that really only start kicking in when you get down to these um, to these mass ranges. Are you starting to look into, you know, like what happens if you change the dark matter model in your zoom-in simulation and then run that's, universe machine on top of that? Yeah, that's ongoing work. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's all I can say. That sounds but great. We, yeah, we can discuss more of that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that sounds great. I'll, I'll ask a question first, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of on along that line. So not only different dark matter models might be interesting, but also including effects that are not usually included in simulations, like the baryon dark matter stream velocity, right? So that supersonic stream velocity can create structure, and it's, you know, at the very low mass end. And is there any, like, plan or thought maybe to include that in universe machine? That would actually be really useful to connect like the scales that and the mass ranges that you can't really simulate in like a large cosmological box. Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about all these suggestions. We are not like yet here, right? We're still working on the classical dwarf regime, so anything can sort of be considered as an implementation into our model. Yeah, we, yeah. we should talk about that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, there's actually a, a question on Zoom. 
John, I think you can unmute and just ask your question yourself if you want. Say your full name, please. Sure. Yeah, this is John Wu. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I was wondering, since it seemed like uh, you were able to say something about the accretion histories um, as part of the model now, can you uh, place uh, constraints on the Milky Way M31 accretion histories or even those of the Saga host galaxies? I think that's a really good question. Um, I think what we can do is to marginalize over all, oops, my laptop died. What we can do is we can marginalize over the posterior space and the different host uh, properties that we have that, uh, why is it working, sorry. Um, but I think it's more constrained on the satellite. And once we jointly constrain the model with, um, you know, all of these diverse sets of Milky Way hosts, we can select a subset of them and say, let's take the top 5% of Milky Way masses and see if they have like uh, more quenched satellite populations than uh, the average, or if we pick some, you know, early assembling Milky Way halos, do they have like very different uh, subhalo populations than the average? So we can sort of start to explain things like that. Yeah. Great, thank you. All right, so if no more questions, let's thank Richie again. Thank you.